You just tuned into the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. All right. Got some cool stuff for you today. Here's what you got to do to get the cool stuff. Oh, what is that cool stuff? This is what that cool stuff is. It's red juice from Organifi. You get a free container of red juice from Organifi. This is energy producing. It's got cordyceps, rhodiola, and more. Take it pre-workout, stimulant free. It's good stuff. Here's how you win this. Leave a comment underneath this video in the first 24 hours that we post this video. And then Doug is going to go through the comments, pick the best one, and they're the one that's going to get that free red juice. They're the one that's going to win that. So make it a good comment. Say something you think Doug will really like because he's the one picking it. And, you know, Doug, he's uh, he's a little picky. Uh, by the way, turn on your notifications so that you know when we post these videos because we give stuff away all the time and you got to get in in the first 24 hours. And then, of course, subscribe to this channel. One more thing before this podcast starts. We are still running the promotion on Maps Hit, Maps Split, and the Bikini Bundle. All of them are 50% off. You got to go check them out. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Spring Break. All right, enjoy the podcast. Which one of you guys started the fire on YouTube uh, with all the trolls? Ooh, what? You didn't Who started start the fire? <laughs> yeah, yeah it was great... always burning since the world been turning. Mm -hmm. We're gonna blame it on Justin. Why? Yeah. Which Good. one? What are you the, talking about? The CrossFit Good. one's going. Oh, I of see. course. Of, what do you mean? Which one? Of, of course, it's going nuts right now. Yeah, of course. We knew that was gonna happen. Yeah, you know what? That's I, where they hang out. Apparently, you know what I, I find. You, you know what's funny to me is, okay, so I guess uh, if I had to identify with a modality of training, it would be bodybuilding. If I had to, like if I, right. had, if you had to put me, if you me, were forced, right. If you were, if you were to put me in a category of how I train most often or what I, what mm. I gravitate towards the most, it would be bodybuilding, which I find it funny that people get insulted and they feel the need to defend CrossFit. When we talk about these things, it's like, if you were to talk shit about bodybuilding as, Oh, it's a terrible way of lifting. And I, I That's wouldn't, who I am. Right. I wouldn't feel <laughs> I, I wouldn't feel the need to like come rescue it and well, be like, well, that is so wrong and you don't know what you're talking me. about, well, Sal. There's one thing to uh, attack. Like, talk about drinking the Kool-Aid. Well, here's the deal. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, you have to get more specific. So you could say bodybuilding training sucks. Okay. But why? Why do you say that? Yeah. And then if someone sits down and lists, well, if you constantly isolate muscles, you create maybe some dysfunction, it's aesthetic focused. So you don't focus so much on mobility and on functional strength and movement. Those are actual good critique. They can be very good. Absolutely, critiques. and say you know we talk about how many people get into the gym because they're insecure about their body, and I could make the case that you know training for aesthetics and you know using the mirror and the way you look as your main motivator is actually a terrible way for most people to train right. and most clients that I train. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't get offended by that. No, no, I, I, I poke you, holes in every uh, method that's out there. Look, look, but only when we talk about that one. Okay, here's this is what it reminds right. me of. Years ago, I don't know, this was probably, I think it was 1994, I want to say. I remember I was watching TV, and this commercial comes on TV, and it's like this cartoon character, and he's like punching the ground, and it's like ultimate fighting championship. Oh, I remember that. Find out which martial art is the toughest, yeah. boxing versus judo, taekwondo versus karate. And it was like this huge debate back in the day. When I was a kid growing up, you'd yeah. watch martial arts movies. And it was always kung fu versus karate or boxing. Yeah. And it was this huge debate. Which style yeah. is the Who's most effective? Who's going to use the five-finger death punch? Yeah. And you know what we ended up figuring out through mixed martial arts? That that all of them have strengths and all of them have weaknesses. Right. And the best- And um, guess who the biggest badasses are? The, the ones that can, that can do all of them. The, the one yeah. that utilizes the strengths right. and, and nullifies the weaknesses. Okay. Similar with training modalities. Mm -hmm. Does yoga have strengths? that are superior to other forms of modal modalities. Yes. Does yoga have weaknesses? Yeah. Absolutely. What about bodybuilding? What about powerlifting? What about CrossFit? What about kettlebell training? All these things have things you can learn from and use together to construct the mixed martial art of training, essentially, for the average person. Now, if you want to be special, let me put it this way, uh, using the same martial arts argument. If you want to be the, the world champion at Shotokan Karate, does it make any sense to train in wrestling no. or devote any time to wrestling? No. No. The sport of Shotokan karate is specifically karate. Your best bet is to focus all your time on karate. So if you want to be the best CrossFit athlete in the world, right. it makes perfect sense to go focus all your time on CrossFit. Think, same thing with powerlifting, bodybuilding, et cetera. But if you want to, have a, you want to train your body, the average person, you want to be fit, well-rounded, 
Your best bet is to take a little bit from each one. And of course, you're going to lean more in one direction than another because of your preferences. Like if you like squatting and deadlifting a lot, you're probably going to do more powerlifting than the other types of lifts uh, or, or modalities. But you can take a little bit from, from each one. Yeah, but we, we've done, what, 1,500 episodes? And we've poked holes in every modality. Every modality. Yeah. We shit on everything. But only when we talk <laughs> about that one do we get this, this – this, the feedback is crazy. Well, it's always a, people that get so butthurt there's a, there's about a bit, talking about CrossFit. There's a bit of a cult. Uh, yeah. A bit? Yeah. A bit Come a, on. Jesus. Know. It's ridiculous. Well, and here's the thing. Because people will say things like, oh, I, you know, I work out at a CrossFit box and the way that they train, they teach technique and they focus a lot on form and it's very appropriate to the person's level and there's lots of individualization of the training. My question oh, for those people is- functional training. Yeah. Well, well, my question is always this. What makes a form of training CrossFit, right? What are the things that make it CrossFit? Yeah. Please define it. To my best estimation, and I'm pretty good. I know this. I know I, I, I understand CrossFit quite well and I know you guys do too. To my best estimation, what makes something CrossFit literally is the sport of CrossFit, training for the sport. Other than that, mm -hmm. what they're utilizing are deadlifts, squats, presses, cleans, they're running, they're doing exercises. And yeah. doing them all right doesn't make it CrossFit. What makes it CrossFit is when you make it the sport of CrossFit. And even if you want to go into the modality of it, uh, they've pulled from every other functional training method that already existed. So it's like this culmination of all these other training, uh, you know, methods out there that, um, you know, does have legitimacy into it. But uh, what makes it CrossFit is the intensity. It's the competition of it. It's the actual sport of it that, uh, you know, differentiates it from everything else. Right. I think it's the feeling of superiority that I love to just poke at because that I think they think that sure. many people that take it believe that. And we now, mind you, there's a lot of people that listen to Mind Pump also do CrossFit are in our community or in our forum <laughs> that are not like that that are yeah. like understand the points, but they, and they can say, hey. I like doing it. I love the community. It's I've been very consistent with it. I totally hear all the points that you guys make. Yeah. I try and make adjustments into my routines and add mobility days and do things like that. But yeah, I totally get it. But it doesn't mean we're telling people don't do it. It's just when we think I, when I talk on this podcast, m the person I think I'm talking or who I'm trying to communicate to are the people that I trained for 20 years. Yeah. Those people. Yeah, average person wants yeah. to get in shape. Yes, mm -hmm. not the supreme athlete. Who who is who is trying to compete in CrossFit? I mean, by all you should be doing that if that's what you want to do. I'm talking about you know Susie, who's 55, had three kids, tried to lose weight 20 for the last 20 years, yo-yo dieted most of her life. Which, by the way, this is like 70 percent of the clientele that would come through the door of a gym that would hire a personal trainer. That's who I'm talking mm -hmm. to. I'm not talking to you, 20 year old kid who's in great shape, great mobility, and, <laughs> and you know well, don't have weight it, issues. And there was a comment in there where one guy's like, "I lost, I think it was I don't remember, it was like 80 pounds doing CrossFit. There, you know, therefore it's amazing." Well, okay, let's 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 just use something else. I lost 80 pounds playing basketball. Yeah. I lost 80 pounds crash dieting, playing soccer. I, I lost 80 pounds doing jujitsu. Does that make it the best form? Maybe, maybe for that person. Look, if you love it and it's working for you, actually, I'm never going to argue against that, right? Yeah. Uh, unless you're getting lots of injuries, unless you're, you know, complaining about problems, I'm not going to argue that. It's it's obviously worked for you. It's obviously brought you more benefit than good. Yeah, but you got to be even careful saying that because the sustainability of it. You as a as a coach that's experienced, you know that. Like right. somebody could have easily right. I don't recommend so, any hardcore sports for weight loss. Yeah, I mean somebody could have easily lost eighty pounds by gr you know grossly reducing their calories and running five miles every single day, right. and just because they liked doing that during that time and that's got them those results. Me as a, a professional would still not recommend that as an ideal way because right. what I know is the sustainability of that long term. It's just not realistic. Most people okay will not run five miles a day and eat thirteen hundred calories forever. And so even if that did work for you and you mm -hmm. do like doing that, that's the problem that I have. Well, with you that. know what the issue is? And you guys, we see this in, uh, in diet culture as well. If somebody does something and it, it gets them to lose weight and change the way they look or the way they yeah. feel, they're a fervorous uh, evangelist at that point. Yes. They're, they're so married to it. So you could talk to, talk to anybody who's lost a lot of weight doing uh, keto or going vegan or paleo or, whatever, cabbage juice diet, whatever. And what you'll, what you'll get is a somebody's very religious about what they just did. Well, I mean, you could bring it, instead of diet, bring it back to training modalities. Sure. People get the same way with that. That's why there's a community of power lifters. There's a, commu there's a community of crossfitters, a cr community of bodybuilders. 
And so it's no different. I'm ta I talk to them the same way. It's like I mean, that when I was bodybuilding, one of the biggest flaws that I saw in my peers was that's the way they always trained. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, you guys know that if you just moved out of this, you know, super setting, isolation exercise, pumping exercises all the time, you would see huge benefits if you power lifted for a little while. Yeah, like and, you have no idea. And that's actually a great, a great point is that even if you are extreme in one of the sports, there are some things you can learn. It doesn't have to be a ton, but there are some things you can learn that'll also benefit you. For example, Bodybuilders that take from powerlifting, uh, they build more muscle as a result of doing that. Some of the best yeah. powerlifters in the world, excuse me, bodybuilders in the world were powerlifters at one point. Ronnie Coleman uh, is, a, is a great example of that. Um, you know, you could do that for most of these modalities. And I think you're doing yourself a huge disservice when you put yourself in this camp and it's us versus them mentality because you're no longer open to growth. You're no longer open to progress or even just seeing what's not working for you. Make no mistake, when you get stuck in a in a mentality, you can actually do yourself a, a, a quite a bit of harm. I'll, I'll, I mean, going back to the diet thing, I can't tell you, I would get messages from people, especially when we first started the podcast, I get messages from people who are like, hey, Sal, I've been doing keto for for four months. I feel terrible. I'm very constipated. When is, when is my body going to transition? When's it going to start feeling good? Like it's not been four months. It's not working for you. Yeah. But because they're so stuck on this camp that they're ignoring their body signals. You see this with training too. Yeah. Hey, Sal, I lost 40 pounds doing CrossFit, you know, but I had to get, you know, a shoulder injury. You know, I, I feel really run down. You know, I got my testosterone levels checked. It's down. So, you know, when is that going to start to reverse? Well, maybe that's the wrong modality for you right now. Well, maybe it's, it's, it's literally everything we've learned over the past year or two is, is how tribal everybody is is and, and how much they don't want to hear a counterpoint or, or invite a discussion of, you know, uh, admitting that there may be some flaws, in, you know, in the methodology. They don't want to like examine that and, and think critically about things. Yeah, I know. It yeah. cracks me up though. Yeah, it's it always, it always cracks me up. And I yeah. think, I think part of me likes to, of to, course. to trigger it. Yeah. Yeah. Of it's course. like, let's start this conversation. Yeah. Because I feel like we, again, we've talked about all the other modalities in this podcast, but nobody brings that up. Everybody's like, Oh, these guys talk shit about CrossFit. It's like, bro, <laughs> we talk about every modality yeah, every we're, and everybody is and by the way by the way everyone is just as guilty of gravitating towards one modality and sticking to it i mean that was a lot of the motivation of starting the show was that we wanted to break those barriers yeah, and right. teach the average person that there is something to take from power lifters there is something to take from kettlebells there is something to take yeah, from crossfit it's easier, it's yoga. easier to stay in that one uh, train of thought in, in that that same pattern because you it's your body like it, it likes that i, I want to keep doing what i like to do i don't want to challenge and myself. i get i get it we're the same way too we're just as guilty it's a human condition yes when yeah. i assess the way we all train we all tend to gravitate towards the things we like most but i'm we're all aware of it and yeah. we all know like okay it's been a little while i've been pushing the weight too much i need to get out of here go into my bodybuilder way or i need to go mobility focused right. or hey i'm gonna pull the kettlebells out and get working on some rotational stuff like so yes i mean i'm just as guilty too but i'm i'm also aware enough to be okay that when someone you know points out one of those modalities as having flaws i don't get attacked personally like it's <laughs> you're coming after <laughs> after me you're like all i can say is like yeah you're right that is a flaw in that training modality yeah, yeah. well i mean look again to just to hit the other side uh f for as long as i've been in, in fitness professionally which is over two decades and non-professionally which is much longer uh no strength modality at all was able to get people to squat and deadlift and to use bumper plates. None. Bodybuilding failed at that. Powerlifting failed at that. Weightlifting failed at that. It was CrossFit. It was CrossFit that literally got people to squat and to deadlift and to use platforms. Before that, mm -hmm. you could you would not find a platform. They in, certainly didn't invent it, though. No, you would not <laughs> find it in any gym, and you would not. And, and literally, I would manage these forty thousand square foot facilities. There would be one squat rack, and nobody yeah. would use it. And deadlifts, God forbid, you saw a deadlift, people would freak out. So. CrossFit single hand. That's why I'm grateful for CrossFit. It single handedly got people to do some of the most effective exercises known to man. Does that mean yeah. I can't critique some of the other shit? Yeah, Absolutely. Now not. evolve and be better. Yeah, I mean that can't. <laughs> That's all I'm so, asking. All right, since we're on the, the training uh, uh, tip here, um, so a study came out. Here's some more controversy: comparing two exercises for blood for for glute development for butt muscle development. Blunt. Yeah, no, blunt. Blunt. I know blunt. For for, <laughs> for butt development. It was the hip, hip thrust, thrust and what and the barbell squat. Ooh, so yeah. they compared the two to see, okay, which one builds more mass 
in the glutes. And the tr and believe it or not, the design of the study was actually quite good. Yeah, let me hear it because this there's a, a Brett Contreras study. No, it wasn't. And okay. you know, okay, I'll have to pull it up to get to give you those details. Has Brett commented on it yet? Um, Since I know this is his wheel. This is a relatively new. This is a relatively new study that came out. But it said, and, it, and literally, it was not bad. On weeks, ready for this? So this is this is what they did for for both groups. So they took two groups of women. And they, they, one group did squats, the other group did uh, hip thrusts. On weeks one, five, and nine, the women did 12 to 15 reps with 30 to 60 seconds of rest. On weeks two, six, and 10, the women did four to six reps with three to four minutes of rest. On weeks three, seven, and 11, the women did 10 to 12 reps with one to two minutes of rest. So they periodized you know, well. So yeah. they did a good job. For both, okay. Yes. So it was not not bad design, right? right? And the whole thing was 12 weeks long. So it's it's a short, relatively short study, yeah. three months long. But I mean, you know, most studies are that long, right? Yeah. So over that over that course, here's what they ended up finding. They ended up finding that the the squat, ready for this? The squ both exercises saw growth in their quads and glutes, but the squat led to more than double the glute growth. What? Twice Ooh. as much muscle in the butt, and then of course expected six times more quad growth. So obviously the quads, right. way more growth way with more the squats, involved. but twice as much growth in the butt from doing a barbell squat. Oh my, oh my goodness! God. Now, Sounds now here's like what we've been arguing. Yeah, we we've been saying this for a long time that the barbell squat is the best glute exercise, generally speaking, right. for most people. But, however, there are cases where the hip thrust is probably better. For example, people who's quad dominant. Quad dominant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're getting twice as much butt growth, but six times the quad growth. So that was if a, you're all quad, no butt. This is what I was going to ask or poke holes in that study is yeah. that we're assuming that I'm, a, and based off of this study for sure, these the ladies that were squatting had good mechanics because if they at all had if they had any sort of issue like that where they're quad dominant you would see a huge discrepancy in that for sure yes and then then what you might see and that's where case by case this matters somebody who actually was doing an isolation exercise like a hip thrust for the glutes would see potentially more results from that because they don't know how to activate their glutes in a squat as well. Yes, if you're somebody whose butt you just don't activate very well when you squat, you don't feel it very much, your quads respond, your butt doesn't, mm -hmm. a hip thrust might be a great exercise. By the way, they're both great exercises. If they had a third group and they compared the third group to the other two groups and the third group did, did squats both? and hip thrusts, yes. oh, yeah. then you'd see the most uh, glute right. growth in my in my. It's very opinion. complementary to a squat. I yes. mean, and that's the thing. And like that's a great point in terms of the quad dominant uh, type of situation where you're recruiting already heavily uh, from the quads. You know, it's it's just uh, inevitable that you're going to have more growth in that direction. Yeah, well, and that's very common, especially yeah. with a, a, a female client that is coming to you to build their butt. They, I, they probably I, have that issue. I would say more than half the time when I got a client like that that came to me and said, Adam, I've been trying to build my butt forever and I just all it does is get my legs more developed at least half the time. But that what was the we issue. know with the squat is just like you have to produce a lot more force to pull off that movement. And so you have to actively recruit a lot more muscle fibers to uh, generate this type of force and get involved. And so that's what creates this louder signal, which growth it, well, has more potential. Not to mention, too, you've got, you know, you got three parts of the butt and part of that is stabilizing the hips. And there's a lot more hip stabilization when, you're, go when you're going into a deep squat than there is in a, more of an isolated exercise like a hip thrust. And the, the, the most glaring difference is the range of motion. Your your glute yes. range of motion and hip thrust is half mm -hmm. what a full squat is. It's a very full it range just of motion. Hinges, really, right? It's almost an isolation exercise. If you, I mean, your knees. I are mean, involved. I consider it. A, I consider it, even though it's technically not. I consider hip thrust an isolation. Yeah, it's exercise. much more right. The knee knee extension is minimal. It's mostly hip, yeah. right? But they're both awesome exercise. But it's a great study because they designed it very well. They compared the two groups. They did good periodization, and what they found is what we've experienced with our clients. The barbell squat is the king of, of butt building uh, or just lower body exercise. But let's say you're a woman. By the way, a lot of the way your body looks isn't just your absolute you know muscle size. It's also your proportions, right? So, so let's say you want your butt to grow. Sometimes, even if you make your butt grow a little bit, but your legs are smaller in comparison, now it looks like you have a more balanced looking butt on your physique. Now we're talking more of a you know, like what you would, how you would judge a bodybuilder or a bikini competitor. Right. So in something like, if, if you're a woman, you're like, I don't want my legs to grow or sculpt at all. I just want to grow my butt. A hip thrust might be, uh, you know, your, your prime exercise. Well, I mean, that would be, yeah. an example would be like, we were just, we were just mentioning that, you know, over half the clients that I got that came to me that way, 
they would be an example of, okay, I don't, I, I can't take that girl who just came to me and said, Adam, I keep developing my legs and I can't develop my butt and I'm not going to throw her on a barbell back squat right mm -hmm. away. That's not what I'm doing with her. I'm doing exercises to help her get connected to the glutes, which that's where hip thrusts are incredible for. I mean, talk about such a great exercise for somebody who never feels, you know, butt exercises in their butt. You're going to feel your butt in hip thrust. For yeah. Sure. And I, I've been doing them relatively regularly for the long, actually the longest period I've ever done hip thrust. I have uh, a hard time watching you do that. I know. It gets you, makes, gives you, I don't, gives I mean, you a weird boner. Yes, it's, just, um, it's just weird. <laughs> don't make eye contact. I, uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, the carryover that I'm seeing for uh, squats and deadlifts is quite awesome. It's, a, it's definitely an additive Now, I would exercise. think deadlifts. I, I, I would think it would have mm -hmm. a lot of carryover. Especially on that lockout. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I would think deadlifts, it would have a, a, a massive carryover. Maybe more a little more bit. into my deadlifts than my squat. But okay. you know, here's the thing about squats, dude. If my squat goes up, my deadlift goes up almost every single time. Hmm. So every, anything I do that makes my squat better, my deadlift goes up. In fact, I can not deadlift, get stronger in my squat, go grab a bar in three weeks or four weeks and see that my deadlift. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, not the other way around. If I just train deadlift, my squat. I, you know, I've never paid attention to that. That's interesting. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that's for everybody, but I think it's it's relatively common. It's uh, It definitely is uh, for me. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you, Adam, uh, I know you're doing the, the reduction in caffeine and you've been using the, the red juice more consistently? Yeah, I just stopped actually. Okay, so you, how long did you do that for? A week. Yeah, about a week. About a week. So it's today your first caffeine day back? Well, technically it was yesterday. Okay. Yeah, okay. technically I was back on, on caffeine again yesterday. So, so tell us. So, so you survived. So what was the problem? So amazing. How did it feel going off using the red juice? Because the red juice has no stimulants, but it's got the rhodiola and the cordyceps. So I should be, okay, I, I need to, I guess, clarify too. I don't, full, I didn't fully go off. And sometimes mm -hmm. I do this. Sometimes I do go completely off caffeine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just reduce it down to my cup of coffee in the morning. Right. So I love, I, that's part of my routine. I li like Justin. I like to, first thing when I wake up, I like the smell of the coffee in my house. I mm -hmm. like sipping on it now on my drive over here. So, and really, when you're talking about a cup of coffee, what are we talking about? 60 to 100 milligrams of caffeine. Depends how big it is. Yeah. yeah it's just, a, it's a normal coffee cup. Yeah. It's not like a, probably around 100. Yeah, yeah. You know, so 60 to 100 milligrams of caffeine. But where I, where I can get really out of control is the, the rock star, which is 220 milligrams. And then the pre workout, mm -hmm. which is like another 250 mm -hmm. milligrams. You're talking about 500 more milligrams. Yeah. And that's kind of my peak, right? Like a coffee, a rock star, and a pre workout in a day. And yeah, I'm, what's a nitro? Is that like 200? To, depends to, on the size. Yeah. Yeah, but it's typically stronger because it's cold brew. Okay. And when they cold brew it, uh, more of the caffeine. Because they let it sit yeah. in the in the right. cold water. So sometimes so I'm, I'm riding high. So depending on how long <laughs> yeah. I've been riding high, uh, sometimes I'll go completely off for like a week. Sometimes I'll just reduce all the way down to my cup of coffee, and then I'll reintroduce things. So what I did this time was actually only just reduce down to the cup of coffee. I eliminated the 200 milligram either pre workout or rock star mm -hmm. or, or post you know drinks like that, and I replaced with just the red juice. When I do that. I, you know, it's not, it, I don't feel that bad. You know, you, you've talked, Sal, before, like you're so sensitive to caffeine and mm -hmm. when you get hot, you go up high and then you come off, like you feel miserable. That's because I go cold, cold turkey. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I don't like I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to do it with the red juice. I've done it before and I do notice that it does take the edge off because what sucks when you go off caffeine cold turkey is you literally feel like shit. Yeah, I'd get a headache from that. If I, I, if I, I went from the- You do? Yeah, yeah. I would get a headache from going that So I don't get a headache. I just feel depressed for like a day or two. Mm. It's actually very nasty. Like yeah. I feel irritable and just- ugh. What's awesome though is that, so I did that and then today I had two cups of coffee and I'm flying. Yeah, now you're on fire. Yeah, you know, flying off of yeah. two cups of coffee you, where I was, I barely would feel two cups of coffee. You see they have the individual packets now? Yeah, I saw that. So that's good. I like this and I like the new packaging that they put. So it's got the cordyceps and the, the rhodiola in there, a little bit of beet juice. And do you think the cordyceps is part of what is mitigating the coming off the... Explain that. Any I'm adaptogen, theoretically, which cordyceps you could classify as an adaptogen, will help with your body dealing with uh, any kind of stress, which would include um, you know, coming off of a, a stimulant like caffeine, because caffeine increases circulating levels of uh, catecholamines, right? So you go off. I guess technically you could say it's kind of a stress. So yes, it might help. I think it's more the rhodiola. Mm. Oh. The rhodiola is a by itself, which is funny because I don't better. like rhodiola in high doses. Neither do I. Mm. Yeah, if I take too much, I'm. You know what? This is. It's. I'm like this with ginseng. You ever take ginseng? I have, but I don't think I've ever paid attention to like how it makes me. It's not feel. Siberian ginseng, but the legit Panax red ginseng, like the the one that's like they would say it's very Yang energy or whatever. Mm -hmm. If I take 
like a small dose, I actually get good energy from it. I take a big dose of it. You, you ever buy those? You ever see those like, they're like glass vials at the health food store? They look the same. They've been around forever. And they're in that box. You know what I'm talking about, right, Doug? And you put the little straw on there. That's a strong ass dose of ginseng. Yeah. If I do that and I do that like two days in a row, I feel like I have a fever like the next day. I don't do you, feel good. Huh. Same you, thing with rhodiola. Do you remember when we were, we were working with Fit Aid and they had the one, I forget what color it was, which one it was that had the rhodiola in it. Do you mm -hmm. remember? I think it was the teal one. I want to think, I want to say it was that. I don't know if you guys remember or uh -huh. not, but I, I know it had rhodiola. I don't know if it had ginseng too, but I do know that that made me feel like shit. Like down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes me sleepy. I would take mm -hmm. it, you know, thinking that I'm supposed to feel better and energized because that's what they say you're supposed to yeah. feel from rhodiola. And I would feel actually super tired. Well, you know, I've been tripping out on on, on on pure organifies pure like so is there lines main in that because yeah, yeah cuz um you know there's been a bunch of research on like psilocybin and the maps institute and all that has been going through that i just found out like uh the ufc i guess has been making a lot of efforts towards um you know taking fighters through some of their uh, uh you know research on like utilization of maybe microdosing psilocybin in order to uh you know gain some kind of neurogenesis from that and and help you know, help, help rebuild yeah their, and stuff yeah wow yeah their brain health and so like i've been looking into that. i've just been i've seriously I'm addicted. I've, I've been taking it quite a bit, uh, especially before podcasts. But I've noticed that I can recall information a lot easier. Yeah, you got to be consistent with uh, very consistent. Lion's mane works better the longer. We should get back to that. I remember when you were making us when we when we first started working with it and they got the pure. I remember us like yeah. for a while there. Well, you know what's interesting? Time. It's noticeable for me. Back to what you were saying about uh, like the ginseng or rhodiola making. You know, there's this paradoxical effect sometimes with certain uh, compounds. For example. For some people, caffeine, once they hit a certain point, not only does it not make them energized, it makes them sleepy. Hmm. So have you guys ever experienced well, didn't this? I, where didn't, you go too much and then all of a sudden yep. just makes you tired? Didn't, I, yeah, didn't I bring up to you, I thought I read somewhere a long time ago that caffeine technically is supposed to be a downer and the feeling you get of energy is the body fighting against that. It, it, uh, I can't remember how it works. I read that it, somewhere. And it blocks, I it blocks yeah. certain receptors and then it causes a, causes a flood of chemicals that give you more energy. Yeah. yeah. But on it, but it's a stimulant, right? Caffeine. But for some people, once they go past a certain amount of mm -hmm. caffeine, this happens they, to me. they get really, really tired. Yeah. This is true with some, with other compounds, uh, uh, benzos, benzo di uh, which are, you know, anti-anxiety medications like mm -hmm. Xanax. For some people, there's this rare situation where they'll take them. Not only will it not give them relief from anxiety, it can make the anxiety way worse. And then the weird thing is they'll take more thinking it's supposed to help, mm -hmm. and then they'll get fucked up. So this is part of what motivates me to come back off the caffeine is when I notice I start pushing what I just said with the two like rock star or like high caffeine, the pre-workout, and then plus a coffee, mm -hmm. it starts to become, I feel ad adverse effects from it. Mm. I actually will, sure, instantly when I'm drinking it, I feel it uh, like just makes me normal, maybe a little energy. But then in like two or three hours, I feel super lazy and tired. And then the, even worse, I still have a hard time sleeping. So it's it's like it makes me tired feeling because I have that much caffeine mm -hmm. in me. But because I have so much caffeine in me, I also have a hard time sleeping that night. So it's this awful cycle that I get in when I really push the caffeine high. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's so easy for me to motivate yeah. myself to wing myself or wing myself back yeah. off and do that. You know, it's funny wing about it. yeah, wing yeah. it. Yeah, you know, it's funny about um, about supplements and compounds. There's the ones that help your body improve itself over time. They're not usually as popular because you don't feel them right away, right? Mm -hmm. But they're ones that do improve your body's ability to, you know, either recall information or, mm -hmm. you know, reduce inflammation or whatever. The ones that you usually feel, you'll take and be like, whoa, I really feel this. Typically, your body will adapt uh, in a very short period of time, weeks usually, in a way that make those effects then start to go away. This mm -hmm. is true for testosterone boosters, libido boosters, energy enhancers. You'll take yeah. them. If you adapt quickly, it's like, it's not going to last. Yeah. Long. And say, like, oh, this, yeah. this is great. You know, I'm, I'm taking this, you know, whatever compound and I have more higher libido or better erections like with long jack or with horny goat weed. But you take it for about you know a month or two mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it's, like, it's not working anymore. Yeah. Your body adapts. So it's a good idea to, to cycle these things. So I came across uh, something pretty cool. I don't know. You guys probably already know about this. I didn't know about this. Uh, you know how they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, like in these caves, long time ago. Uh, Vaguely, and I mean, isn't that something like old? Those are like books that were not included in the Bible or something. Like that? Well, like so, like most of it was books included in the Bible, oh, okay. but uh, so they were made out of papyrus and anyways, and they and they lasted. But there was one in there that was like a copper scroll. And so this copper scroll was actually like, 
Um, it basically is outlining 64 different uh, treasures in terms of like gold and silver, like distributed. What? Uh, yeah, in different places. And so they're de- they've been decoding this for years, and, and they're they're starting to kind of deduce it down to actually not being near uh, Israel, but being more towards like uh, Egypt. And so like there's all these like treasure hunters scrambling out to try and find this stuff. Does, do any of these treasure hunters ever find a treasure? Well, I was just gonna, that's <laughs> I a good, know. You know, I'm serious. No, like, you, there is. There's a couple. There's been one ah oh, man we were watching this show it's funny because me and courtney watch all of these shows you know all these ones on discovery channel like oh dude we hope they find like oak island and yeah. like all these things like i love the history that they try and uncover with it but it's so boring the shit that they find right it's like oh i found a nail and let's <laughs> let's go take it to the labs like, so what happens boring. what happens if you find old gold can you keep it and can you then sell it and make money? Or I does think, it get claimed by yeah. the country that of origin? Does it go to a museum? I think, what? I think yeah, you actually have to work that out ahead of time, get a permit and then really? and then yeah, and then yeah. a percentage of it goes to yeah, the the country or uh you know, or they like uh, the I don't know. You work it out with them, and you basically like receive the rest. Yeah, of, you think of the okay. So you what happened to possessions nine tenths the law? No, what? Yeah, I, I don't think that's always true. look. At, <laughs> okay, let me put it this way. Let's say you find uh, a Da Vinci painting, like you bought a house in in Florence or something like that. Yeah, and you're just living there, and then you go. And it was included all the furniture. You're, you're gonna one. put you're gonna put a, a pool in the backyard. They start digging. They're mm. like, oh my god, we found, and you found a, a a painting from Leonardo da Vinci. That ain't yours, dude. That's not going to be yours. It's on my land. Yes, it is. It ain't yours. I don't think it's yours. I think stuff. Certain cases. So actually, that's, state, well, so that's not true. Okay, but real estate law. Okay, doesn't work in that America. Way. Yeah, yeah. We actually, you get. I actually, not only do I own that, I own like I think airspace. Up, yeah, right? I own the air like up to like fifty yards above my house. And it's such so, a weird thing. That yeah. You're, oh, and, because you can build on top and of below, it. right? Well, it so, makes sense now, especially with yeah, dr- but, like flyovers. Well, look, I so I don't know how it works here in the states, but I do know in Italy that there were cases where construction workers in Sicily were they were there was a, a company that was building like a hotel or something. They were digging. Oops, we found some r- Roman ruins done halted the state stopped all the construction yeah. they're taking over now because we got these ruins well around. i mean okay that now that would make sense if this is yeah. like a you know city that is like you know coming in and paving roads or you know dem- no, this was dem- a private construction company like a private owner oh yeah land. see that's different I feel yeah like that's that's lame bro. so you <laughs> what's the, what is the point of being a treasure hunter if you got to give your shit up like well, people yeah. like you yeah, must most of the time is a waste of time. You yeah, must like be- Doug just pulled up something about that in terms of like if it's yeah it, like it, the the country will t- like take all of the earnings. You so, must so you must have to already be rich to be chasing a treasure because and the- I think too that like if if it's in the ocean you have a higher likelihood of keeping a lot of it because it's it kind of gets tricky as to yeah. who owns that. Here, here you go, Adam. Oh my God! There, there you go. Yeah. Hey, you and your your your, your real estate law can suck it because look at this. <laughs> this is the federal bullshit law. That's what I'm gonna call this right. In the U.S., laws vary by state, but the general conclusion is that going treasure hunting is a waste of time because you likely can't keep it. The Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979, of course, states that any archaeological resources found on the land of the state belongs to the government. Boo. So, wow. You know what? How many of these assholes are actually searching and don't even know this law? Yeah. You know what? The, yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know how pissed you would be? Bro. You spent well, like because what? They want to go into museums and all that? Like, uh, for you, know, you, have to be, you have to be wealthy already to That's even boring. consider being well, a, a treasure hunter. I think hunter. this is what you end up doing. You're digging in your land. You're like, oh my gosh, I just found another dead sea scroll. Yeah. You ain't telling anybody. Of course not. You're going to the black market. Who wants to buy this? Yeah. That's what you're probably doing. Of course. Otherwise, you ain't making shit off of this. Yeah, yeah that's you know? weird. This reminds me of, it's just, I don't know, it reminded me of it. Did you guys hear about the, there was a, a snorkeler or a diver off the coast of Florida? He was diving. Oh, yes, you brought this up to me. Bro. Was this off air? We talked about this? I, we might I have talked off air. You, yeah, you found the cocaine, right? He found like, like <laughs> I don't know, like 30 bricks of cocaine. They must have dropped it, you know, because uh, yeah. there's always boats or whatever. Yeah, we were speculating what we, what we would do. You were like, oh, I would keep yeah, that shit. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> I was like, no, you wouldn't. Oh, no way. Bro, you just stole some drug dealer. The cartels are monitoring yes, that, Yeah, that's cartel that's drugs, bro. I know, but it's it's a, it, you'd probably be afraid, right? You'd find it and be like, oh, uh, 100% do I do? I'd be, I mean, you only, you trade it, you turn it in. 100% you trade it. Who you tra- sell it to? You know, <laughs> somebody might be, keep think, a brick. Yeah, yeah, I only found 29 bricks. Yeah. Yeah, that's how many I found. No, I mean. a huge party. The Yeah, the cartel or mafia, whoever's drugs it is, would love to see that it's gone and it that, they, get, that the government and it, doesn't and have yeah, it and the, and the, yeah the government the cops don't have it that means there's some average Joe out yeah. there with their drugs Dude, they're getting creative I, you. I saw a video the other day of the National Guard 
literally, uh, they were pursuing a submarine. A freaking submarine that was made, that the cartel made. Oh, yeah. And the submarine was, it's not like a full-on submarine. It's enough to evade, evade what is radar. It? I brought up the documentary before, and I can't remember the damn name. What, you know, I, our audience is normally gold for this. I, there was a documentary on the this guy in Miami who started a boat shot, speed boats, and that he used oh, to, yeah, you'd buy that. these speed boats and they would be like $200,000, what it would, would include is the shipment of cocaine or whatever like we that. They call them cigarette boats. And yeah, and they, they made so much money that they, I think the way they ended up getting caught was they ended up buying a submarine. Oh, like a legit yeah. submarine. Yes, like a legit <laughs> submarine. <laughs> From I the old rem- Soviet Union. Someone's got to help me out with the documentary. Well, in this video, really in this video, they're pursuing the submarine. And again, it's like, it's just under the water. Mm-hmm. So just enough to evade radar, right? right? But you could see like the- You could the, see the top of it. Yeah, and they were- they were following next to it, and the freaking National Guard guys jumped off the boat on top of the submarine, and they're bait with the butt of their gun. They're banging on the on the on the hatch. Get out! And the guy opens it up, and they're pointing their gun inside. I'm like, oh my god, these guys got balls the size of freaking That's watermelons to do oh that. You know, you uh, you bought a, you brought up real estate, so I got I got I was yesterday. I was uh, reading a bunch of stuff on a, a recent article. Uh, I forget the name. NORAD, I think, is the name of the the article. I really like the stuff that they put out on. They just a lot of analytics. It's a long read, but really good. Interesting fact, right? So I'm all I'm I'm obviously I'm always trying to figure out like time this market like, and and if and there's tons of articles out there on are are we heading for a 08 crash and are is it going to continue to boom through this year right. and like everybody everybody has a debate and argument. Well, and I I like to look at all the analytics and then make up my own mind what I think is going to happen. Part of the things that are are driving this we know are interest rates, right? Part of why we have this crazy you know continued growth in the real estate market is because even though housing prices continue to skyrocket, someone that bought, buys a house today is really not spending that much more money monthly just three, four years ago. Because the that, interest rates. Because the interest rates right. are so low. So that's part of it. Another thing that's driving it like crazy is in 2018, right? So just two, what, two and a half, three, yeah. two and a half years ago or whatever like that, uh, millennials represented the smallest percentage of home buyers. In 2018, today they're the greatest percentage mm-hmm. of, of home buyers right now. So you have a flood of a generation of people that are now at the age that they can afford to buy that are trying to buy with interest rates at record lows. And in addition to that, inventory is at its lowest since 2005. So when we had that huge boom in 05, mm-hmm. when you, everyone was, so there's not enough real estate interest now, is that rates because so high, preven- and we had the most people coming in to buy. Is that because they're preventing the, a lot of foreclosures? And so stuff that's from what, it, the so mm-hmm. now that was a, that was a theory that I had earlier, like last year, but the truth is, it, it there, we're not going to see foreclosures like the, the moratorium again. Again, is being told that they're going to lift it again. I think mm-hmm. at the end of this month, I don't remember the exact date. I don't Just know if they're moving it. Yeah, they keep pushing it out, pushing it out. But I don't think it matters. Even if they pull that moratorium, and we're going to have some foreclosures. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's inevitable, right? But I don't think we're going to see this these record amount of foreclosures because much most of these banks. Would, banks don't want to foreclose. You have to first understand that, right? A bank It's nev- a loss for them. They yeah. they do yeah. not. They want to keep collecting. They're in the business of collecting interest. Mm-hmm. They do not want to they're not in the business of Yeah, that's damage control at that point. Yes, yeah. they absolutely and that's what we saw in like 08 and 09. Like they didn't come get houses for years. They were hoping to work things out. Yeah. So that they don't want they don't want to get houses. They don't want to collect houses. Right. And so you have to understand that, that that's the last resort. And when you have these homes that people bought two, three, four years ago, a lot of people, especially in California, are sitting on two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in equity. Right. They would much rather just extend the loan and say, "Oh, you had twenty-five years left on your loan. No, now you have thirty yeah. again." Well, it is interesting, right? Because because uh, so did you guys see the inflation numbers come out? No. Okay, so inflation is going up, uh, but less than they thought, which is funny how they they judge it. It's like it's up, but it's not as bad as we thought it would be. Mm. Partially because people are not buying stuff as much as they, mm. uh, the, 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 the demand to purchase things, I think people are scared to spend their money, is controlling inflation uh, a little bit. Um, and uh, along those lines now, interest rates are going up on mortgages. Not the big ones, right? You said the jumbos. Yeah, jumbos actually. So all interest rates over the last two months. Because when inflation goes up, that's what they tend to do, right? Have, they they yeah. throw up in, in, uh, you know interest rates and all that stuff. Yeah. So it is very interesting. Here's the other interesting thing. When they count inflation, it's funny. They're t- they'll, they'll take food and gas prices out of the inflation numbers. Oh, it's only we're only growing at this much. Like the two most important things you know, is food and <laughs> the gas. Day, yeah, necessities. Yeah. But they do expect inflation to start yeah, so to climb the, quite a bit. So the pre- the prevailing theory is that we will see uh, 
interest rates slowly climb. The, you, the, the banks are, are, are guaranteeing that they're not going to raise rates ridiculously. So you're, we're not going to, mm. they're like, you were talking about 3.1 to 3.6, right? So that's, right. that's the, the prediction of where it's going to okay. go. So, and the prediction yeah, is that nothing. we're going to still see double digit growth this mm. year in real estate prices. So it'll continue to go all the way through summer. It's going to stay hot because inventory is low. Interest rates are low mm. buy, and there's still more buyers than there are houses. And then we might see a slow up, not a crash or a dip yet, but a slow up to a plateau at the end of this year. Mm. My personal prediction is 2022 is when we're going to start to see the dip mm. because of all those things. I, it's going to give also construction companies, by the way, too, a part of what's caused this is the halt on construction companies. Like yeah. With the COVID and everything like that, you couldn't go out and go build a bunch of well, new houses. Have you seen the price of lumber and building materials? Yeah, materials are going way up. That but, too. Oh, exploded because yeah. of the manufacturing. 50% yes. increase. Yeah, yeah, went down. So that alone will make the, the cost of building new things uh, you know, go through the roof. Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to see what's going to happen. Another thing that they're talking about is, so they have these, these companies that will purchase lots of rentals, and they'll own like... 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 units, and they typically own apartment uh, complexes. This is usually how they, these big companies that own rentals typically invest in multi unit, you know, complexes. But what they're finding now is that these big rental companies, big companies, are now moving into the single family home market because so many people want to rent now single family homes. They want a backyard, mm. they want space more than ever before. You, normally, that market of the, of landlords are small small owners. It's not these big companies, but they're finding these big companies are moving into the small family home market, which might drive the price up even more. Well, that's more. why you see it get snatched up so quick. Yes. You know, something that we were wrong about that we talked about was this this exodus from the um, from urban living to suburban living, mm -hmm. and that we we've seen like all these houses on the outskirts of cities right. increasing. And actually, comparison, like it, when you look at the numbers over decades and stuff like that, it's all relative. So there's a surge in urban just as much as there is oh, a surge I in see. suburban. Oh, yeah. it's, not, it's, not, it's not out of whack. Hmm. I think a lot of us thought it was and thought, oh, my goodness, all these prices it are going. It would have made sense, yeah. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, just as, it's just as hot in urban. So it's not like it, you're seeing this huge difference like you, what we thought earlier because yeah. we heard, hmm. you know, because all the, of course, the media is, you know, talking about, oh, this mass exodus in San Francisco mm -hmm. and L.A. and everybody's leaving. Uh, not not like what we thought. I mean, it was. I do wonder about those cities, though, like in New York, uh, San Francisco, L.A., like what that market's all going to look like with like all these vacant buildings. Well, rent has gone down quite a bit in San Francisco. Yeah. I know I got I got family that lives over there. And oh yeah, for the first time ever that they can yeah, remember. Yeah, I was going to say that's got to be a record. Rent has gone down. I so. I have another crazy stat there. I want you to look this up because somebody else. This is word of mouth. This is I didn't read this, so I want to know if this is true. I was told by a client of mine. She said that. Um, 0.5% of California is uh, how many uh, millionaires or billionaires, billionaires in the in, in California. So 0.5%. So wait, wait, 0.5% of California is billionaires? Are billionaires. And of that 0.5%, they are responsible for 50% of the taxes paid in California. In California. Of all taxes Gavin paid. Gavin Newsom takes all the credit for that. So yeah. <laughs> there's so there's this big fear of like, you know, the Joe Rogans and all these people that are like that are leaving California. Absolutely. On what that could potentially do. See, fact check me here, Doug, because I think it was either 40 or 50%. But that's crazy. Just say, A what percentage of California's taxes are paid by California billionaires? There you I go. I guess that would be the best yeah, way Yeah, yeah, the best way to Google it. But if that's true, that's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that's small, not even a percent of the population. Well, so the way that five percent of the population. It, it, okay, I don't know what that number. I don't know if that number is accurate. But um, if it was, I would believe it because of the way the tax system is designed. It progresses up as a greater percentage. And I mean, look, you, if you pay thirty percent of your taxes and you're a billionaire, or you pay thirty percent of your taxes and you're making a hundred grand a year. In terms of total dollars, way different. Yeah. Way different. So that would make sense to me. Right. It takes thousands of those people to, to even equate to that one absolutely. person. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very wealthy pay a big chunk. I mean, I know we look at their taxes in relative terms. Oh, that billionaire, he only paid, you know, you know, 10, you know, a hundred million dollars, but he's got, you know, a hundred, you know, billion dollars or whatever. I get it in relative terms, but in terms of total dollar terms, 
wealthy people pay a huge chunk. Well, it's an of it, interesting just a total dollar. It's an interesting place for California to be in, considering that a lot of these billionaires are tech billionaires, yeah. which doesn't require you to be here. Well, so that's what I find really interesting is that it's different if you become a billionaire and you have a brick and mortar business yeah. that you built in a state. Mm -hmm. It's a total different thing if you built a virtual business or you are a tech company, right? And you have, and you have you the uh, yeah. ability to probably move any you state. Can just you just relocate want. pretty easily. Yeah. Well, have you seen so sometimes states will do that though what, what states will do is they'll entice them to come yeah, over dude. yeah you saw that with tesla. Uh, tesla and oklahoma yeah there's like bidding wars to get those companies you imagine that you're like you're, you're like some successful business person and you're at home and then they're like oh you got a phone call who is it it's the governor of you know virginia huh yeah. get on the phone hey listen uh yeah free if you move over free, here, what free pancakes for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> you guys move yeah. i'm sold dude i'm coming oklahoma here we come yeah, yeah, yeah. free pancakes you know what i'm saying oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but hey, you know, pancakes. back to inflation i think the the so the last time we had big inflation was in the 70s. And look at the interest rates back then. They were double digit because that's how they control it. I think it's fair. It's very, it's more than reasonable to expect that we're going to be getting some crazy inflation at some point. I mean, we've printed, yeah. but okay, this is a it's crazy. It's impossible not to. You I, you get one or the other, right? Well, you either get massive inflation or the dollar goes down to being a peso. Well, that's what it's like one or the that's other. That's what happens. So, because right. if you look at the total amount of money that exists and that's in circulation, this is a crazy thing. The vast majority of it was literally created recently. The last year. 50%. And that's before, by the way, that's before this $1.9 trillion gets passed. I know. So it was already at 50%. Another one9 gets gets passed. Now you're talking like 75% of the money is that also- has ever been created. That's not attached to any sort of good service or labor? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, I know. We're so, just playing with Monopoly yeah. money now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. Wow. We'll see what happens with that. I guess the best way to protect yourself is to buy, I guess, assets that'll rise in value along with the inflation, property being one of them. Yeah, the article actually talked about the, the increase they predict from now to 2025- uh, for rent renters, just the amount of renters that will that are going to be hitting the market is mm. going to be a, a ton. So oh. one thing I want to before I forget, Justin, I overheard you talking about that you're going to be eating salmon. I'm very yeah, proud well, of you. I want to like uh, prove <laughs> you guys wrong. <laughs> I want to show that it, I'm not just all fish sticks. You know? yeah. <laughs> like, like I have more versatility and uh, capabilities here. So. Where'd you get the salmon? Uh, butcher box. Oh, so, it's theirs. Yeah, it's I still box haven't salmon. had that one. You haven't? No, I haven't had their salmon. Doug, I've you I, you do it, don't you? You get the salmon there. Mm -hmm. How is it? It's good. I you mean, know? it's yeah. I don't. I've only had it a couple times, but it was good. Yeah. So this is the first time I'm actually going to smoke it and put it on a Traeger. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, so yeah, Courtney's getting that all ready to go for when I get home. The key with salmon. Right this is Doug taught me this. The key with salmon not to is, overcook it. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's we went undercooked. We went to a restaurant uh, years ago, Doug and I, and dry. He and ordered chewy salmon, and he goes, uh, "I'll have it uh, medium rare." And I'm like, you can order salmon like that? And he goes, absolutely. So I said, I'll do the same thing. Totally different experience. Yeah. When you cook salmon too much, ugh. I know. It's not good. It's so it true. You know, it. I just, yesterday I had a, a poke bowl that was with salmon. And it's like, it's raw salmon. I like the taste of that better than I like a, a restaurant salmon that's cooked. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't think, I think it tastes really dry. Dry and like pasty. It sticks to your teeth and yes. all that stuff. No, yeah. no, no. If you, over, if you cook it the right temperature and then if you season it right and whatever, salmon is, abs and then you eat it with rice, mm -hmm. oh. Is that what yeah. you're going to do? Are you going to do that tonight? Yeah, I can have it with rice, yeah. Now, butcher box salmon, that's all wild caught, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. no no farm. No, and so you're going to get a leaner piece of salmon. Yeah. So if you like really fatty salmon, uh, then yeah, you, you're not going to get that with uh, the butcher box. All their meat, obviously, is the grass-fed, you know, natural, kind of healthier varieties. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there you go. Yeah, salmon or tuna. I mean, those are the ones, like, if I have to eat fish, like, I'm going to go in that direction. Wow. Oh, wow. Look at this statistic. So wow. The top fifth of households got 54% of all income and paid 69% of federal taxes. So the top 1%, so the top 1% of income earners paid 25% of all federal taxes. So a full 25%, a full quarter of all taxes in terms of dollars was paid by the top. Now, and that's 1%. all. So this is, I'm that's guessing. federal. Yeah. So this is also, this is countrywide, right? This is not just California. Right. Yes, that's correct. So I imagine that's skewed even more in California because we probably have some, between us yeah, and New York, probably, probably have higher. the most most billionaires. California has the big, one of the biggest uh, wealth disparities that yes. you find anywhere. Yeah. I mean, people, so I, that would cause that number to yeah. be even more skewed. People don't know this, by wow. the way, because people who've never been in California or lived in California, they think California is Silicon Valley. They mm -hmm. think it's LA or San Diego. 
the truth is California is either really expensive mm-hmm. with lots of people make a lot of money or, or poor or yeah or it's or it's it's like it's the it's like middle middle of the country type you know where yeah, it's like yeah. cowboys and farms well, and cent- that kind of yeah, stuff. Central Valley like uh, this is, is ignored by pretty much everybody else. Like, well, it's you, part of California. Yeah, you have Modesto was where I, I grew up in that area, and that was actually rated like one of the worst cities in the entire yeah. country. Well, I re- as far as crime, yeah. poverty, and like jobs, like it was like one of the worst places to well, live. Well, I remember in the managing my first gym yeah. in Salinas, and I was a, you know I pretty much stayed in San Jose and went to LA a couple times growing up, so I never really went to other areas. I remember going to Salinas and seeing cowboys. And I was like, cowboys are in California? They're like, <laughs> There's rodeos there, dude. They're like, actually, California has a lot of cowboys. They yeah. have a lot of that that, yeah. that culture. A, yeah, it's yeah. just not in San Jose, yeah. you know? So funny. Yeah. Hey, real quick, before we get to the questions, head over to mindpumpfree.com. We got a lot of free information on there, free guides. Everything from guides that help you build muscle, burn body fat. We even have guides to help you become a better personal trainer. They're all totally free. We wrote them ourselves. Uh, mindpumpfree.com. All right, enjoy the rest of the podcast. First question is from vitamin C, Na. How much of my daily protein intake can I eat per meal? You know, this is super common. Yeah, this question comes from, uh, you know, because the, I guess the fitness space, or the supplement space in particular, communicates for, for a long time, they've been communicating that your body can only assimilate, you know, 30 to 45 grams of protein at a sitting, which essentially is their amount of protein that you'll find in their bars and their protein powders. And if you eat any more than that, they you know kind of imply that it's a waste uh, of protein. Here's the truth. The truth is uh, if you can digest the protein that you eat, then you can eat a lot at one time. In fact, the thing that you should use to dictate how much protein you eat at a sitting should be your, your digestion, how you feel. If you get bloated, constipated, diarrhea from eating – you know, 80 grams of protein, then you might want to, at one time, then you might want to bring it down a little Is bit. Is it really digesting it? Or, I mean, if I go and I have three scoops of whey protein and 10 minutes later I'm on the toilet and I have diarrhea, am I, did I digest that, then poop it out? And so I still absorb the protein, got the benefits, or did I lose some of the benefits of that 90 grams of protein I, I just I had? think what you do is, uh, well, you might lose some of it through going through the, the, the system too quickly. Yeah. Um, but You're I pooping think, something else out, by I, the way. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, not, I, it's not that. I think a lot of it- I mean, it, it looks like whey, kind of. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Here's the like chocolate different. whey. Jeez. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's so gross. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you, you can recycle it. Just get, oh, oh, yeah, that was too far right Sorry. there. This is what happens. No, I, no what I mean is, uh, okay, so let's say you do assimilate the 50 grams of protein that you just consumed. However, you've messed up your gut. You've got more inflammation. Mm. Stress hormones go up. Um, are you going to gain the other – are you going to gain the benefits now? Well, no, because you've caused a – negative reaction of the body from consuming too much for in your example whey protein at yeah. what time so really that's the thing that you have to use to measure it the problem is people look at studies and they say okay uh, muscle protein synthesis is maximized if i have 40 grams of protein if i eat more than that then it starts to drop so i need this much and you know it's 10 percent more or whatever it's all splitting hairs and it yeah. doesn't make that big of a difference. The big difference is your digestion. That's what you need to oh, pay yeah. attention These to. These numbers are arbitrary at the end of the day. If if you're not paying attention to those signs and signals, and you know, this is something that I would really peer into personally because of food intolerances and things that I had to work through. Uh, so even, you know, restricting myself from eating past a certain amount of time, like in the like if it's seven thirty or so, I can't really eat after that. I know it's gonna affect my sleep. And then, you know, when you turn into a gremlin. Yeah. When your sleep gets affected, <laughs> then you're your workouts suck and yep. you know it's it's like this uh you know this like domino effect after that yeah and I, I would also look at types of protein i can have way more protein uh at one sitting if it's from whole foods than if it came from protein powders yeah i agree yeah, yeah I, I don't know if you've ever have you ever tried to have no yeah gram- no so i can eat 80 grams of steak you know so 80 grams of protein from steak mm-hmm. i can't have 80 grams of protein from whey pr- powder so dairy mm-hmm. products it just it, it goes right through me so mm-hmm. there's yeah. definitely a there is definitely something different going on with my body when i when i go between the two yeah, of them. it seems more bioavailable you know rob wolf actually just uh, addressed this on his instagram the other day he got this exact same question and 
he did he did allude the, to the bodybuilder community uh, getting this right mm. uh, with the idea of the, the small meals, the small meals, thirty five or so grams of protein over the course of four to six meals in a day, depending on how big you are and how many calories you need. Uh, as as far as the benefits of the you know consistent protein synthesis that's happening each time or the protein spike mm-hmm. that you get afterwards, and then also the uh, idea that to your point that you know when you're only digesting 35 grams of protein, most people's body, unless you have any sort of conditions, can handle that no problem without having a major effect on your digestion. So, to me, it, it really goes back to you know what's realistic for the client. Like if you have a client who's only eating say 1800 calories a day and let's say she only needs 130 grams of protein well you realistically do that in two meals Mm -hmm. you know two to three meals easily but if you have a guy that's 230 something pounds and you know is trying to build and is training like aggressively and burning a ton of calories and needs to eat Mm -hmm. 5,000 calories a day and 200 grams of protein Good luck doing that in two meals. I just I don't see that happening, especially if you plan to do that with whole whole good foods. Yeah, and that's that's one of the main. I think that's the main reason why bodybuilders eat small meals. It has more to do with you're eating five thousand calories uh, in a day. Uh, but for most, really uh, honestly, the thing that should dictate how much protein you have at a sitting is just how you feel in your digestion. If you go off of that, um, then you're golden. Next question is from Dylan James Russell. I'm curious about whether or not a massage helps promote muscle growth. Also, do massage guns actually work or are they a marketing gimmick? You know, you have the most experience with this, Adam, because uh, Katrina is a very good uh, massage therapist. And I know you when you guys first got together um, and you were competing, you, she massaged you all the time. Yeah, that's why I married her. I mean, mm-hmm. that was the that was that's the, it. That's, the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's how she got me, I'm for sure. For you know, the skills. Uh, truth be told, though, before her... Um, I actually wasn't a big believer in massage therapy. I didn't have uh, any great experiences up until that point. Um, it, by the way, too, at this point in my life, I don't n- even know the difference really of like a Thai massage, mm-hmm. a, a Swiss massage, a, a deep tissue sports massage, like all these different types of massages that they do. I, I have no clue about any of this. And my experience up at that point was, you know, I just felt weird. I lay down there and someone kind of rubs all over me. I don't really feel this relaxed feeling everyone talks about. It wasn't until I met her and she was able to, like, she knew without me telling her, like, all these problem areas that I was having from training. It was amazing. And then she would go in and it would be rough. Like, it was deep. Like, she'd go in deep on me, but the release and the feeling I would get afterwards was game changing for me. And she did this all through uh, the years that I was competing. And I swear that. This has a lot to do with what allowed me to recover as fast as I did and continue to scale the volume at the rate that I did during those three years compared to where I'm at now. Like now, obviously, we have a kid now. She works all the time. So I don't get massages like that. And I feel how different my body feels today than I did then. It's amazing when you come across a, a good therapist like that. Like to, You don't have to tell them anything. And they, they already know exactly what's going on with your body, like what kind of patterns you uh, you have throughout the day. Uh, and you know they can identify these, these muscles and things that need the most attention and work. Uh, so that's something that I took on with my clients as well. I used to trade out uh, with one of my massage therapist clients. And so it was it was game changing. I, I, I knew for me, like I would get a massage and I would work on very specific uh, areas of my body, which then would allow me to uh, regain some gain, uh, uh, so, some some range of motion so I could work on that with mobility drills and things like that. Yeah, I, the- think, I think that's the area where we got this wrong. Like we I think mm-hmm. the way we explained it for so many years was off like that community like i remember even when i first met her they, they still use like chi and they talk about energy right. moving in the body and when you're a guy like me that's like nah, that's right. not, i don't I, no you're, I, you're training the central nervous system through proper massage when you're applying pressure on a muscle it, it the central nervous system reacts and responds and it in one of the main weight reasons cuz does massage help you build muscle if done properly yes the main mechanism is through improved ranges of motion and better connection uh, to your movements. I've, I had a massage therapist that worked in my personal training studio that was excellent at this. And when I worked with clients and she worked with the same clients, their progress was absolutely, it was, it was so much faster. It was accelerated. So the same way mobility or foam rolling can help you squat better, deadlift better, press better, and that kind of stuff, which then will result in more muscle. That's what massage can do. Now, a good massage therapist 
is even better because it's very individualized and they can read your body and work specifically on your body. There is a small muscle building effect for massage itself though. Just the pressure on muscle, same thing with stretching. If you deep stretch a muscle or you apply a lot of pressure on muscle, it does send a muscle building signal. Now it's very small and it doesn't come close to lifting weight. So mm -hmm. you can't just go get massages and expect to get results like if you worked out. But it does build a little bit of muscle by itself, so it does have that effect. What about the what about the benefits of like improve like blood, blood flow, flow and circulation yeah. and oxygen to a totally. muscle? I yeah. mean, if you think of it that way too, if you're if you're getting a massage in the area and if you get improved blood flow and oxygen, which means more nutrients gets the muscle, I would also assume that that yeah, would those help. Those are the speed main up. drivers for recovery. Well, right. think, think about it this way: when you have a tight muscle, and the way that uh, therapists will communicate is they'll say you have like a knot, like oh you got to get that knot out, and then they'll press on it and do the thing, and then you'll feel it release. Right? Really, what's happening is that muscle is partially tensed, so it's just tight and tense. Overactive, and it's, and it's probably protecting a joint or protecting some movement pattern. You got some, you know, bad, you know, mobility or whatever. So that muscle's a little tight. But when a muscle's tight, when a muscle contracts, it squeezes blood and fluid out. When it relaxes, it allows blood and flow and fluid in. So if you have tight muscles all the time, you have restricted blood flow, right. which means you're not going to be able to get as many nutrients to those muscles, inflammatory markers to the muscles. You're not going to be able to build muscle as effectively. When they press on the muscles and work through the muscles and get them to relax, blood flow increases. In fact, this blew me away. The first time I really ever had a good deep tissue massage, I got off the table and I was pumped mm -hmm. like I had finished working out, yeah. which tripped me out. Pumped and loose and mobile. Yes. That's the biggest That's the biggest thing I noticed. I noticed now, like today, like we're not massaging like, the, like we, we were back then. If I overreach, which happens a lot when I'm training, especially training legs after a heavy squat or deadlift day, I'm so locked up the next day, it's hard for me even to get into my mobility or do yeah. my stretching. Where if I got a deep tissue massage, like I was back in the days of competing, I would be ready to go the next day. Yeah. Sure, I'd still be a little sore, but I would not be nowhere near as tight as I was, which would not limit me in my workout mm -hmm. that day. So we agree that's probably the most ideal way to do it. Uh, the other part of the question was about the massage guns. Mm. And so for them, I I look at it as, you know, it's a tool. It's something else that I can kind of pull from just like a, a, you know, a foam roller or something like that where, uh, you know, I'm looking at a very tight, very restricted part of my body uh, that I want to, you know, sort of regain, uh, you know, like some mobility there and some some range of motion in my workout. And so I'll, I'll actually self-apply and I'll use those every now and then. And it does, you know, help to to get me into that place, but it's definitely a temporary effect. Yeah. And, and massage guns are, tool, like you said, they're a tool. They're only as effective as the person administering them, right? So like any tool, you can get a hammer or an ax or whatever. It, it's not going to do anything unless somebody who knows how to operate it uh, effectively can maximize its effect. Same thing with a massage gun. So just buying a massage gun and hammering yourself with it, well, you'll get some benefit. Yeah, it you might. It feels good, but, you know, but it's going to not going to last. But if you really know how to apply it, uh, that's when you get – so trainers and coaches probably are, the be are better. Massage therapists are the best. There's nothing that replaces that. Next question is from Jassian G. What are some muscle building tips for teenagers? Oh boy, when it comes to muscle building, um, the best advice I can give to a teenager, and this of course is you know with appropriate form and technique, the best advice I could give you is just focus on getting stronger at the big five lifts, at your squat, your deadlift, your overhead press, your bench press, and your row. Just get strong at those lifts and that alone will build more muscle on your body than any other training style or methodology or technique that I could possibly think of. I also, there's a, a lot of things running through my head right now as far as the things I'd go back and tell my teenage self. Uh, one of them would be uh, the over application of intensity. Um, oh, yeah. as a young teenage boy, you know, full of testosterone, lots of energy, motivated to change my body. Uh, I apply, I went thinking that, okay, the more I do, the more results I'm going to get. And for a kid that was really active, I played sports. And in addition to that, I was training six, seven days a week. It's extremely difficult to feed the body enough calories and nutrients to even let the body recover and repair and grow like mm -hmm. you need it to. So that was like the first mistake. And what goes hand in hand with that is the second thing I would tell myself, which is track. Today we have these tools that didn't exist when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was calorieking.com book or not .com, it was calorie king book before .com. I remember those. Yeah, the calorie king book. And then it was just a, a notepad and paper and I would write out and then figure out where I was. And then I'd have to guesstimate 
based off of whatever I was reading, whatever book I was reading at the time of, oh, based off my age and how mm -hmm. much I was moving, I'm probably burning this much, which God, I, I can't, I can't imagine how inaccurate that was today. We have tools today that are like 90% accurate to what you're burning on a regular mm -hmm. basis. So that information was huge. And I didn't get that into my twenties. And when I got into my twenties, body bug came out. And at that moment, I remember realizing like, holy shit, I'm burning like 5,000 calories a day, which is a tremendous amount. But when you think about, I was 20 something years old, playing sports, personal training, eight hours a day. It's pretty typical for a kid. If you're 25, young man, training eight clients a day. And you day, already have a fast metabolism. Yeah. Right? And I mean, so the amount of food that I was, I needed to eat to make my body grow, the, I wasn't missing. It wasn't the gym. I didn't need to hit more weights to grow. It was I needed to either, one, move less so my body wasn't burning as much or significantly increase my calories. So I would definitely go back and tell myself that. And then the third big, like, you know, game changer or paradigm shattering moment for me as a trainer was learning that how important the big lifts were. Yeah. I was your typical teenage boy who, you know, if I did legs, it was leg press and leg extensions. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it, bench press. Sure, I did bench press every once in a while, like barbell stuff, but I always loved to do hammer strength and mm -hmm. cables. I loved every time I went to a gym, I, all the new machines, and I, I really neglected the big five. You know, I'd go back, and if I could go back and do it over again, I would tell teenage me, I'd say, listen, mm -hmm. I, all I want you to do are those five movements for the yeah. next five years. That's it. You're not allowed to do anything else. Just those five movements. Get great at them. Well, that was my entire answer, so thanks. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. no, seriously, though, like, uh, keep it simple. That, that would have been my best advice to totally. myself because – uh, you're drawn towards a lot of the flashy stuff, especially when you're younger. Uh, you see, especially me being in like the athletic realm, uh, you always try to, again, emulate um, what your favorite athlete is doing and whatever workout they're promoting in their magazine. Uh, you know, very similar with bodybuilding, I'm sure. You know, same type of a, a thing where you're going to look at and idolize these, you know, these behemoths. Uh, but, uh, you know, for me, it would really have been to just stay there, stay in the big five, um, really master the tech technique. This isn't about overloading the technique. This is really gradually progressing your way up uh, after you've really ironed out and sharpened that technique to the point where you're a master of them. Because uh, that's what that's what you're going to carry on for, you know, the rest of your life. That's that's the foundation. That's you know the the basis of what you build off of. And it, and it builds the most muscle. I mean, from from the for me the, between sophomore and junior year of high school, that's when I started to focus on those. There was a group of powerlifters, older guys. That gave me great advice, and they were big, strong dudes, so of course I listened to them. And they literally said, get really good at squats, get really good at deadlifts, get good at bench, overhead press, and barbell row. Practice them often, so like three days a week. Yep. Don't go to failure. That's what they told me. Have perfect yeah, form and just get strong and then feed yourself. And from in between those two years, sophomore to junior year, I gained over 15 pounds of muscle. Literally grew out of my pants. I remember I had to buy new clothes, and it was like the most growth I'd ever seen in my entire life. And it was 100% because of that. Next question is from JBLSZKW. What do you think of functional patterns and their stance that weightlifting in its traditional form does more harm than good? Is that the one dude that we, we got into it a little bit yeah, a couple years ago? We the did. big uh, unilateral rotational yeah. dude yeah. that does all the crazy he, shit. He's in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah really? Yeah. Okay, so he's, he's got- a really smart guy. He's got really, really good stuff. There's a really, really smart dude. But he falls, uh, you know, prey to that whole, I'm in a camp uh, that you start to see in the Just like space. the conversation we had earlier. Exactly. And uh, no, I, first off, I disagree completely with this yeah. statement. I think what he provides is very valuable. But I think to say that weight training in its traditional form does more harm than good is totally and completely false. There's a lot of value in all the modalities for training. Um, and a lot of what he says has to do with unilateral training and rotation. And I do yeah. think they have a tremendous amount of value. Is there value in training with both feet together, barbell work, traditional type of, of absolutely, routine? absolutely the absolute strength you gain from that you can't compete. You can't deny it. Yeah. No, you can't deny that you're going to gain 50 pounds on a squat 
is going to be equivalent to a 15 pound gain or 20 pound yeah. gain on unilateral exercise. So, well, in terms of building muscle and and you know actually gaining size, and there is reasons why people want to do that. You know, and it's uh, you know to to say that it's doing you a disservice uh, by training that way. You know, I have a problem with that. Uh, but I do like a lot of what he emphasizes, which is you know rotational strength and uh, you know moving the body, you know contralaterally, uh, you know doing a lot of things that we don't consider. Uh, in our programming and we don't see it in the gyms uh, very often at all. And so it's like, he's kind of highlighting stuff that people are neglecting, but he's building an entire camp. That's like fervorous just about that one method. Well, we absolutely consider this in our programming. That's why one of the things that we're most proud of is maps prime and the prime pro program wow. is addressing these types of imbalances that people have. And he talks a lot about posture, mm -hmm. which I know that was something that all of us were big on when we first started. This was, you know, we have to address what we would always address with clients, which is, oh yeah, I know Miss, you know, Susie, you want to lose 30 pounds or Tom, you want to gain 10 pounds of muscle, but along the way, we're also going to address right. all these issues that are going on in your body. And so I, that's where I have a lot of respect where he's coming from. I, I, I totally get it because he is obviously somebody who's trained a lot of normal ass people like ourselves. That's the reason why I know that we challenge a lot of these other modalities that is pushing the, the yeah. beast mode all out, the CrossFit type of mentality is that they're, your average person has got so much dysfunction mm -hmm. that a lot of their work should be around unilateral and rotation stuff. So I can get behind that. But then I, the problem I have with it is the same thing at the beginning of this. That this divisive function. stance, I just can't stand behind. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think it's a great way to get attention. I think it's the name of the game with social media. And here's the deal. There, there's a reason why, I mean, when we all discussed getting in new media um, as trainers, the reason why it was hands down podcast, the reason why we decided... We're going to do a podcast. That's 100% the route we're going to go is because these conversations around fitness are nuanced. They're mm -hmm. not, they're, they're, they're complex. They're never yes, no answers. No, I can't talk about, you know, how to lose weight effectively in a post or a picture um, or if uh, bench press is the best exercise for chest in one blog or post. It's a conversation. A lot of it depends on the individual. There's a lot of value in all these different things. Look, even the most useless machine in the gym, okay, even the, I don't know, abductor machine uh, in the gym has some value to some people. Have mm -hmm. I had clients where that was where I took them because I saw value in Maybe it? Maybe the least value, but right. you, you get what I'm saying, <laughs> though. Had just, some value. Just, just a Smith machine is like just above that. Yeah, but, but, you, but you get what I'm Smith saying, machine. right? Yeah, yeah, that, no, so, there, so traditional resistance training, he's got lots of value. So does a lot of stuff that he does. I think he's playing that game where he gets in his camp, yeah. puts up his wall, say those, you know, let's make these, these big statements uh, so I can get more attention type of deal. That's what I think's happening. Yeah, well, I mean, he creates a really like strong fan base that like, our way is right, yours is wrong. Yeah. And it's this tribalism that just persists in our industry, which drives me crazy. Yeah. Well, he's, I mean, it, he talks to, he walks the walk and talks the talk. If you look at a lot of the transformations oh. that he's made posture wise, that's he, his main focus. He does great work. If you pay attention to the stuff that he's really high, highlighting he addresses posture right and and here's the thing where uh, again well, I can, an overall movement i general. can defend his stance right you got somebody who's got you know lordosis or they've got excessive you know internal rotation of the hip or they're pronating really bad on one side and then you load them with 225 pounds on their back yeah, of like course. yeah not a good idea like you need to address or all you those do a issues. bunch of isolation exercise on them right exactly so uh, i could get behind a lot of that stuff and what the work he's doing is good work i just I, I think I always get annoyed when people are like, this is the way, because it's, it is so individualized, right? Yeah. The, the hallmark of a good coach or good trainer is when they answer a lot of questions. Depends. By saying it yeah. depends. Uh, look, go to mindpumpfree.com and download some of our guides. We've got a lot of guides. They're all free. Some of them teach you how to build better arms or legs or your midsection. We even have a guide for personal trainers. Go check it out. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. What are, the, what are people starting with? They're starting with the wrong impression is what they're starting with. Okay. And, and, and I think you have to address that first because if you made a pie chart out of everything that you're going to do to enhance performance, you'll find that this pie cut for drugs is probably 15 or